Hi, I'm Dr. Melthammer. Are you suffering from any of the following symptoms? A burning sensation whenever Jeremy Corbyn or Owen Jones tweets, a need to censor yourself in conversations that aren't about you, an irrational hatred of the left because they're skeptical of intervention, paranoia around the funding of left-wing podcasts, a craving for the belief that you're part of the only decent group in politics, a love of conservative MPs who show minimal humanity, then you may be suffering from agrocentrism and should immediately call this number to get your specialised treatment from Dr. Melthammer. 0118 420 69 69. Thank you to our sponsor, Dr. Melthammer. And now, the actual video. I hope you all enjoyed that message from our sponsor, Dr. Melthammer, who you might think was just me wearing my partner's lab coat with a bunch of graphics added in after the fact, but I assure you, he and I are two different people for tax purposes. But what Dr. Melthammer did today was introduce us to our topic for today, agrocentrism. If you've been around on UK politics Twitter, you've probably seen the term used, notably by Owen Jones, whose adventures with this particular political tendency is why I decided to make this video. You probably see these people come into the mentions of leftists online with a statement like, I'm actually to your left, or I'm as left as they come. And then they either moralize about the left, claiming that they're uniquely maligned for one reason or another, or they aggressively explain to you why not starving children or the provision of basic services is not only impossible, but undesirable because of the electorate, who famously don't care about starving children. So what is the deal with these people? Why do we call them aggro? And what separates them from the less aggressive but equally resentful forms of centrism that permeates the UK's political discourse? I can't pretend I have all the answers, but I'll certainly try to explain what an agrocentrist is and why they're so angry at people like Jeremy Corbyn, Owen Jones, Navarro Media, Real Politic, and other left-wingers with any crumb of a platform. Who are the agrocenter? That's a fair question, and not to state the incredibly obvious, but there are really two axes along which this designation is made. One is about conduct, and the other is about the politics they claim to hold. There are lots of groups who claim to occupy the political centre, and while it would be satisfying for me, and maybe for you, to say that all of them behave like this group, that's not accurate or helpful. Okay, so the first group is one that I'm going to very broadly call One Nation Conservatives. There is a history to that term, but I think a lot of people who identify with the Conservative Party and who see themselves as opposed to political extremes tend to be comfortable with this label, though it's worth noting that almost every senior Conservative claims this mantle. For the purposes of this, the most important things to note is that these are the Conservatives who make big sad eyes and tell you how sad they are that their policies are ruining people's lives. But because two lines meet at a certain point, starvation is inevitable and there's nothing we can do about it. So I could go into a whole thing where I describe the various factions of the Lib Dems, but honestly it's not really that important. Yes, some of the agrocentrists come from the Lib Dems, but the source of their angst isn't really based in the fact that they're Lib Dems. But for those who don't know who they are, the Lib Dems formed as a merger of the SDP and the Liberal Party, and they were in coalition with the Conservatives from 2010 to 2015. Then they got destroyed in the 2015 election, elected a barely disguised homophobe to lead them, then a woman who was shitposted into being seen as a squirrel killer, and now they're led by a centrist, vaguely tonally liberal white man who's a knight of the realm. Sounds a little bit familiar on that last part, but... So I want to open with a disclaimer. I know that being very pro-EU membership does not necessarily mean you're a centrist. But they're being included because the most prominent and loud members of this group ended up being approximately in this location on the left-right axis. This group were particularly animated, very online, and well-backed with large amounts of money available to the cause. And in fairness, they managed to pull crowds out. For all of those stop Brexit marches, which as we all know were wildly successful, and we remain in the EU to this day because they made an electoral compromise for the first time in their adult lives and we had a second referendum and remain won. Oh, wait, that didn't happen. To grossly oversimplify an already very simple political program, the Independent Group, or Change UK, or the Cucktigs, or whatever your preferred term from the 27 names they had for themselves, 
formed from opposition to the Labour Party, but they also had Conservative Party rebels join them. So you could take them to represent a kind of centrist attempt to capture anti an anti-political mood. Of course it's hard to capture an anti-political mood when your core platform is things are broadly okay, but let's overturn a democratic mandate in favour of leaving the European Union. So the kind of politician you might find in this group is a star-studded crew, Anna Subri, who was lauded by liberals, despite never voting against punitive austerity measures that caused premature deaths across the country, and who was called the real opposition, despite the fact she was voting alongside the government. I'll be supporting the government. She, she's the opposition. As will. Yes, we're Richard Brown, she's the opposition. That's the that voice of opposition be. in the studio, isn't it? Or Chris Leslie, the genius behind the concept of the Witch Magazine voter. A real big brained one from Chris there. The big man himself, Mike Gapes, known for this moment. And you have the milk that is taken from cows in the south and taken from cows in the north. And the man who delivered the only gratitude Mike Gapes ever got, Chukaramuna. Thanks, Mike. Though he would later join the Lib Dems. This is the first group where a contingent of the agrocentrists really come from. A lot of this group's anti-left animus was based on a childlike belief that Jeremy Corbyn was refusing to press the stop Brexit button, which is just laughable, but they did get extremely mad about it to the point of torpedoing the only thing they claim to care about. Okay, now we get to the fun stuff. The progress slash Blairite wing of the Labour Party. In a lot of ways, the prominent characters who adhere to this ideology might even be the furthest right among these groups, but for the purposes of taking them at their word, and to be entirely fair, as I'm famously inclined to be, I've put them here. These self-styled moderates adhere to a particular brand of faith in the market, and borrow from some modern social democratic ideas, such as harnessing the growth generated by a relatively unrestrained market for social good. Of course, the trouble with that is you end up with the unrestrained market imploding as it did in 2007, leading to the Great Recession, whose shadow we all still live under today. Now, that's not to say that the new Labour government, which this particular group claims as their own, was responsible for American banks collapsing. Indeed, that's a very dis disingenuous claim that was famously deployed by David Cameron over and over again, but it is nonetheless a part of this group's ideology. I know if there are any Labour moderates watching this, they'll be very upset at me mentioning it, but it does matter. This particular group holds to the idea of liberal intervention, and you may be familiar with this small thing called the Iraq War, which this group's deified figure Tony Blair walked us into. Often the retort you'll hear from this group when this is brought up is, would you prefer Saddam Hussein? And, well, we lifted more people out of poverty in the UK than we killed in Iraq, which are just perverse arguments to, to bring in to defend your preferred intervention doctrine. These are also the kinds of people who, for reasons we cannot possibly discern, are incredibly keen on intervening in Syria and Iran on the grounds of preserving life and opposing human rights violations, but they're often suspiciously quiet about the UK's relationships with, say, Saudi Arabia, who are creating one of the biggest humanitarian crises in history in Yemen. This is yet another group where we get some of our agrocentrists from, people who thought the Labour Party was a career path for them, or that they had a god-given right to a Labour Party fiefdom, were obviously a little upset when people who weren't in their clique entered the party, sparking this hysterical fear of entryism, designed to bring up the ghost of militant from the 80s, because that is the decade which these people really live in. So I know the term soft left is complicated, with at least three meanings, and I know not all of them are centrists but a lot of agrocentrists either claim to be part of or are adjacent to the soft left in the Labour Party, and some of them are centrists, moderates who seek to have an accommodation with the establishment of the Labour Party and with the interests they represent. If the Blairite is a figure who delights in intervention and desperately clings on to the achievements which were undone within six months of the coalition government, the soft left centrist is one that reluctantly falls into line, insisting that there's simply no other way, and that people who sit on either extreme are outdated or irresponsible. 
I don't want to dwell on them for too long because they're mostly not especially relevant to the concept of centrism as we're trying to define it here. But you can think of them as a semi-permeable membrane with centrism. Really, the soft left deserve a video of their own, but I've promised a lot of friends that I will not engage in that discourse anymore. So we will leave it there. What is aggro? So we've all had one of those days where we really aren't in a good mood and you just have a really short fuse and you hyper focus on something someone's doing and you end up being really unfair when you come down on them. Well, you can consider aggro as permanently existing in that state when you encounter certain figures or people or topics. One of the hot topics for the past seven years, really starting with the Scottish independence referendum, has been the behaviour of people online and what's often erroneously referred to as trolling. And this behavioural component of agrocentrism absolutely falls into what's termed trolling, which to shed a bit of light on what the press is defining trolling as, seems to mean disagreeing in an impolite tone, which if it was left at that, the aggro component of this would honestly not be that bad. I've been known to be robust online. You've probably been a bit robust online occasionally. There's nothing wrong with wanting to defend your politics. Unfortunately, the specifics of the kind of aggro that prominent characters in this tendency engage in cross certain boundaries and they fit into certain broad categories. I'm going to go over the key ones here, and this is by no means exhaustive, but we'll have a list appear here, note to the future Sinan who's editing this. And if a list doesn't appear here, you have my permission to at him, at the Sinan Coes, and tell him that he did a bad job. So if you've ever been bullied or witnessed it, you probably know what crybullying is. But in case you don't, a crybully is someone who will instigate harassment or engage in otherwise bullying behaviour towards their target. And in the case of a typical agrocentrist, it relies on what some people term pylons on social media. And when their victim or people acting on behalf of the victim retaliate or point out this behaviour, they immediately act as if they were the victim in this scenario. This isn't something that is a uniquely political act, but it is done in the interests of politics. A lot of agrocentrists will, to take an example, decide to attack a somewhat prominent left-wing figure, and inevitably the left-wing figure will respond, so the centrist will accuse the leftist of a pylon, or bullying, or just a kind of incivility that according to centrists should disqualify you and anyone you support from public life. The idea of civility is one that I find interesting to talk about, and maybe that's more of a subject for another day, but it is often linked to this dynamic. Calls for civility in politics often extend in one direction, towards the left, who are expected to put the feelings of their political opponents above, in some cases, their own safety and the ability to espouse their politics freely. In other words, they want to make sure politics is a game that's played without much effect, more like a social club, rather than a struggle between people trying to demand concessions and people who act in the interests of the powerful trying to take those concessions away. I've gone off track, but it should go without saying that crybullying isn't the only type of bullying that a lot of public figures that either identify with or are adjacent to agrocentrism engage in, even in public, even under their own names. This is just... This is extended to a prolonged campaigns aimed at denigrating small left-wing publications and frankly, it's rich to hear about civility and decency from people who are at least as bad as me, maybe even as bad as you. Just kidding. I know you're great. One of the things that sets this particular brand of centrism and online aggression apart is that all of their content is geared towards denigrating, insulting and otherwise seeking to delegitimize the left. A prime example of this is the way that people, no matter what the topic of the tweets are, will reply with non sequiturs, or just general puce-faced fury at anything Jeremy Corbyn, Owen Jones, or even relatively low-profile activist posts. In fact, recently it was revealed that a person had spat at Jeremy Corbyn and the response from centrists, who claimed to pride themselves on civility, decided it was an occasion for silence, or for jokes made in exceptionally poor taste. Really, the joke didn't land at all. The problem with the obsessive anti-left content isn't that these people care a lot about their chosen ideology. That's fine. Everyone who's political ought to care about it. 
it's that it works to sanitize the right and the far right. You'll probably be familiar with the concept of both sidesing, where people will always try to act as if the broad left and the far right are equivalent. You know, things like horseshoe theory, for example. You may have most recently seen it in the UK when journalists decided to make a direct comparison between left-wing members of the Labour Party and the people who stormed the capital in America, which, you know, is certainly an opinion. Of course, the motivation behind this political obsession from people who would probably self-identify as progressives, social democrats and liberals is that their political and class interests are more threatened by the left than the right, at least in the abstract. Let's not get into how the 2017 and 2019 Labour manifestos were very much social democratic and barely sceptical of capitalism, never mind calling for the abolition of it. An especially interesting hypothesis I've seen is that some of the prominent agrocentrists employed by outlets like The Guardian couldn't stand the viable social democratic electoral project because their employment relied upon being the furthest left voice in the mainstream to argue for policies that would be great but could never be realised. I'm not particularly certain of that, but it is interesting to see how commentators who suffered from Corbyn derangement syndrome now argue for his policies, or at least policies similar to the 2019 manifesto that he stood on. Conspiracy theories exist across the political spectrum, and across almost every barrier you can imagine. In fact, I bet you have a conspiracy theory that you think about and say, well maybe, right? And if it's something like Elvis still being alive, or a belief in cryptids, you're wrong, I hate to break it to you, but you're also not really hurting anybody. The thing that makes the agrocentrist model of conspiracy theories interesting isn't that they produce them routinely, it's that agrocentrism and indeed centrism in the UK more generally comes with an insistence upon two things. One, that they're the most sensible and grounded in reality political tendency, and two, that the extremes of political discourse, which they define themselves against, are replete with conspiracy theories, which is something that they naturally reject. Because this video can only be so long, I'll put a link in the description to the Waplington Files, which has a lot of examples of the kind of conspiracy theories that the centre and agro centre engage in, but fair warning, it's a bit out of date. I will be going into detail on a case study that has a large element of its story based in a centrist conspiracy, but if you want a classic example, there's always been this idea that Seamus Milne, a member of Jeremy Corbyn's staff and apparently an ageless being because the man is in his 60s and he looks like that, was some kind of shadowy puppet master. You might also recall the school of thought being deployed against Dominic Cummings who was also cast in this role by the centre, but he was used as a mitigating factor for Boris Johnson, while Seamus Moon was used as an aggravating factor for Jeremy Corbyn. So this one is tough to talk about. I don't want to be very specific about it in a way that puts victims in the spotlight, so I'm going to try my best to speak sensitively about this, and carefully when I'm not referring to well-known public figures. I'm not going to be naming people unless they are well-known public figures. One of the accusations that the political centre in the UK and the US like to throw at the left, and to a lesser extent the right, is the charge of sexism, harassment, racism and bullying. However, there have been a number of reasonably public occasions where a pattern could be established on this front, and the culprits are often those that are that identify with the agro center. It'll be no shock to you that if you're any kind of minority on the internet, you tend to come in for a bit more flack than you might usually expect, particularly women of color. This goes from the most obscure person all the way up to the first black woman MP, Diane Abbott, whose abuse accounted for almost half of the abuse directed towards MPs during the 2017 general election. Often the abuse came from people within our own party, including a prominent case, not during the 2017 election, but in 2015, Labour MP for Birmingham Yardley, Jess Phillips, claimed that she told Diane Abbott to fuck off. I'll remind you that this is a woman who, according to the leaked Labour report, was at times driven to tears by the abuse she received. Later, it was revealed that Jess Phillip had in fact lied about it, but that didn't stop this event being used to catapult her to relative notoriety. She became a centrist totem, despite the fact that she crumbled under the first bit of scrutiny that she was subjected to 
in the 2020 Labour leadership election. Now, there's a case to be made for this to fall under cry-bullying, since Jess Phillips often makes the claim that she is, in fact, the victim at all times, which I'll leave you to judge whether that's the case or not. There are also examples of less prominent figures who have engaged in harassment that's targeted women in particular. A Twitter account called Useful Idiot Watch was created by a known agrocentrist account that is openly spoken to by journalists who work for respected outlets. Now, creating a Twitter account isn't a great sin. The problem is that it would photoshop the few prominent left-wing figures afforded any kind of platform in the UK into a variety of stupid and offensive contexts. The agrocentrist responsible hastily deleted the account following an admission that he ran the account. There's a particular intensity of agrocentrist bullying when they pick their target. Their cast of rotating villains is surprisingly small, and the focus can be relentless, including focuses on appearance or strangely counter to their professed liberalism, attitudes that cross the line into racism and homophobia, among other kinds of bigotry. Portrait of an Agrocentrist So we have enough information to paint a basic picture of our hypothetical agrocentrist, and while they come in all shapes, sizes, genders, ages, and some, I know this will come as a shock to you all, have the ability to grow hair, despite their political baldness. A typical agrocentrist will be in Gen X, financially secure, work in a white collar job, be self-employed sometimes, most likely white though not always, an agrocentrist, regardless of generation, is likely to have been a journalist of some kind, or otherwise pretty directly tied to journalism or adjacent to it. In terms of politics, a typical agrocentrist is in favour of the status quo, to the point that even the usual centrist solution of tinkering around the edges seems radical and even offensive to them at times. Most crucially, they all seem to be painfully in favour of intervention. There just doesn't seem to be enough conflict in the world to satisfy them, and you get to the point where you wonder whether these people worship some noxious hybrid of Tony Blair and Korn. Aaron Bastani, PhD Trufrism, a case study in agrocentrism. So now that we know who our likely agrocentrist is, and hopefully what the term means, or at least some idea of that, I wanted to talk about an example that ties together a lot of the ideas that I've discussed so far. Aaron Bastani is the co-founder of Navara Media, one of the more successful left-wing media projects in the UK that became prominent during the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. Aaron Bastani is a figure who, to put it mildly, rubs a lot of people the wrong way, especially a particular demographic of centrist. It's also important for us to know this fact about Aaron Bastani before I introduce the antagonist in this story. He has a PhD, and he was passed without corrections. To be clear, in case you've never been in academia, or don't know anyone who has been in it, this is not especially common, but it's also not suspicious in any way, and it's actually a sign that his PhD was probably really good. Enter Jeremy Duns, an author who writes spy fiction and about the history of espionage, a noted centrist and a person who seems to really, really despise the left. He decided it was incumbent upon him to do some due diligence on Aaron Bastani's PhD, this is something a lot of leftists have encountered online. If you're qualified in any significant way, it's met with a great deal of scepticism. In fact, one of the funniest encounters I've had online is a, when a group a, of white middle-aged Lib Dems decided to call into question whether I was literate because they didn't like my posts about Orwell and JK, JK Rowling. Really, really normal behaviour, guys. In this case, a conspiracy theory was spawned, and it was that Aaron Bastani had somehow managed to convince his supervisor and his examiners to simply let his work, which according to Duns, was substandard, pass without corrections. In fact, Duns was so convinced of this, he was at one point planning to remark Bastani's PhD. I shouldn't have to explain to you that this is a conspiracy theory, totally untethered from reality, yet because Jeremy Duns belongs to the political tradition of centrism and has a platform that offers him some received authority in the minds of agrocentrists, and they were the people who are most likely to believe his conspiracy theory. This theory is still used by people today, because Aaron Bastani, by being so well qualified, threatens their ideology. 
centrists have what some might call an unhealthy veneration of technocrats and place a lot of value on qualifications. So you might conclude that they're trying to reconcile a person who has the right qualifications rejecting technocracy and their ideology by simply saying he just doesn't have the qualifications. On the words of a person who, as far as I'm aware, has no significant ac academic background in Bastani's field, and who, as far as I could find, doesn't have a postgraduate degree of any kind and would never have interacted with the methodology Bastani used. Does agrocentrism achieve anything? It really depends on what you think their objectives are. If you take them at their word, the agrocentrist is the greatest failure. The Conservative Party sits on a majority of 80 and their anointed successor, who we were all told would be 20 points ahead, simply can't build a consistent lead over a government that, as of recording, has presided over 100,000 deaths as a result of COVID-19. If, however, like a lot of people on the left, you think the goal of agrocentrism was to create the conditions for a rejection at the ballot box of electoral leftism and lay the groundwork for a return of the grown-ups to the helm of the Labour Party, arguably they've achieved some of this. Their uncompromising aggression and abuse has been rewarded, for better or worse, that has consequences for the political culture of the UK, and not necessarily good consequences either. If you were looking for how to own the agro center with facts and logic, or how the left or anyone really can overcome them, then that wasn't really what this was, because as much as I've tried to treat them seriously, sometimes it's just fun to think about the people getting mad, red, and nude online, and just laugh. I just want to say thank you to John Duncan, whose latest video will be the will appear in one of those things that goes above my head, who helped tighten up the script a lot. Geraint from Real Politic, whose podcast will be in the description, and to my partner who proofread this and insisted I include more graphics, particularly the one of the lines meeting on a graph. Oh, I think Dr. Melthammer has left his name tag here, and it seems to have an important message for you all. Thanks for watching, everyone.